Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Dan Turner, and I'm with the Georgetown County Library System, the head of programming and outreach here, and we are broadcasting live from the Georgetown Library, and this is the 10th and final presentation in our DigiBridge series, and this series is sponsored from a uh, bridge grant with South Carolina Humanities, and that came with funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and we're grateful for that. Um, and this, this whole series of 10 presentations has been unlocking much of the, the rich, diverse history and culture uh, right here across Georgetown County. Um, so we're live streaming this on Facebook and for our Facebook viewers out there, please type in any questions you have for our presenter today in the comments section of our Facebook Live event. And we'll ask that to our pre presenter right after uh, her presentation is concluded. All right. Now today, we, we do indeed have a grand finale. Uh, this is our, our tenth, as I said. Um, and this is Marilyn Hemingway continuing the March for Social and Economic Justice in Georgetown County. Marilyn earned her bachelor's degree in journalism at the University of South Carolina and has a long history of professional experience in communications and public relations. She is CEO and president of the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce, which encourages equity of financial, cultural, and educational opportunities throughout the county. She has also served her community as a volunteer board member of the Georgetown County Family YMCA and the Mitney Project, a local nonprofit that provides educational and arts programming to low-income families. So Marilyn will, will conclude us, or bring us to a fit conclu conclusion here, uh, our 10th and final DigiBridge lecture, uh, and here we are to welcome in Marilyn Hemingway. And come on in, I'll slide out this way, Marilyn. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan, I appreciate it. I don't remember giving you all those um, good things about me, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, Heather, and Truman for allowing me to speak today to your listening and viewing audience. I look forward to sharing um, some information to with our folks about Georgetown County's economic and social justice um, industries and how they impact the African American community, also known as the Gullah community. So thank you everyone for give, sharing your time with me. And um, please, I love questions. And I look forward to answering the, your questions at the end of the presentation. My name is Marilyn Hemingway, and I am CEO and founder of the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce. I am a Georgetown native, and my family roots are traced all the way from Beaufort through Charleston, Hampton counties, and of course, Georgetown and Horry counties. My parents met here in Georgetown, and four children later, here I am. All right, so, so I do this also in memory and honor of my parents, Peter and Maddie Daniels Hemingway. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Social and economic justice in Georgetown, South Carolina. We have to go back and lay the history and understand the history of Georgetown and bring us to 2020 and how it impacts 2020, even to this day. And in the beginning of Georgetown, we were known as the rice, the epicenter of the rice culture, based, which was based on a task system which was actually the beginning of an economic system that some of us benefit from today and some of us still seek the benefits of that system. But under that system, we have the ties that bind, the interconnectedness of not just economics, but social and cultural um, justice. And the enslaved were enterprising from the beginning because of cultural reasons and the setup of the rice production system. And it all starts with West Africa and the geographic ties to the low country of South Carolina in which Georgetown sits, and also the cultural ties. These cultural ties were the cooperative economics and bartering found in West Africa. And those were developed 
once the enslaved came here to Georgetown, were brought here to Georgetown, they were developed through the task system in rice production. And how were they de developed? Because each enslaved person was assigned a task, which they were supposed to complete from sunup to sundown. If they completed that task before sundown, sometimes the plantation owner would rent out the enslaved. And when that enslaved went out and they were rented, they were actually able to get a little bit of money and put it aside. Also, the enslaved were sometimes allowed to build their own, to grow their own garden plots to supplement their income, to supplement their diets, excuse me. So they were able to set that aside also. Of course, the plantation owner took most of the monies that they were able to get when they were rented out, but of course, a little bit was saved and a little food was saved. And that food that was saved and grown, they actually started a barter system. Basically, what you grew and I didn't grow, we traded the enslaved. So we built somewhat of an economy. At the end of the Civil War, that allowed certain things to happen. It allowed some of the freed persons left these plantations and came into town. It's also important to note two other items. The enslaved had certain skill sets. They knew how to work leather goods. They knew how to work the cattle. They knew how to butcher the cattle. They knew how to sew clothes so they were seamstress. So imagine the plantation has a small city. And once that system ended, they took those skill sets into town and they were able to open stores. All right. Not only did they open the stores, but they were also able to collectively work together and put that money together. And you see it to this day in the churches, in particular Bethel AME at the corner of Duke and Broad and Bethesda Baptist on Wood Street. They were able to build those churches. And in a few minutes, I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. Within this history and system, you also see the start of the Gullah Geechee culture. Because even though the majority of the folks came from West Africa, they came from different tribes, so they had different dialects. And they had to figure out how to communicate with each other. So they started building a whole new language that we know of has today has Gullah. But within that, they also had commonalities of spiritual traditions, commonalities of the food that they ate. So these things started connecting and started building the Gullah Geechee community as we know it and celebrate it today. All right. So our next slide. There we go. I have to get used to it, folks. Um, our next slide just touches on what I talked about, the West Africa Connections, Cooperative Economics, Bartering, and so on. But in this slide, we just wanted to make sure that you note the, the Georgetown map, and these are our rivers, because our culture is based on water. And in Georgetown, we have a great deal of um, rivers that have created that rice culture in those plantations. And in the second slide, the black and white slide, we had over 300 plantations in Georgetown County. And you can see some of the names there, and some of those names still exist today. Friendfield Plantation, um, Hagley Landing, and so on. All right, so we just wanted to show you those slides so that you can see the vastness of the rice culture and economy. Also, before Pre-Civil War, this is just one of the examples. Renty Tucker was a talented enslaved carpenter that built what we know as the Pelican Inn on Pauley's Island. This is just a wonderful example of the craftsmanship that the enslaved had. And also, you just drive through the historic district of Georgetown, and most of the historic homes were built from enslaved labor, and of course, the plantation homes were also built from enslaved labor. And we just wanted to show you this example and what they brought post-Civil War into town to, to even move forward economically. And that was built by Renty Tucker. Tucker and um, the original, this was the original summer home of Plowden C.J. Weston, who was All Saints Rice Plantation owner. All right, so post-Civil War, from 1865 to 1910, 
This was documented by the Committee for African American History Observances. You might also know them as the Dream Keepers Community Arts Center on the west end of the city of Georgetown. They were able to receive a grant and do the research to identify most of the African American businesses on Front Street of Georgetown. Because after the Civil War, the majority of the population was more than 90% African American. And they had skill sets that they brought into town and immediately they became merchants, butchers, general store owners, um, builders, carpenters, master carpenters, and so on. All right, but there were also an, an interconnectedness, and this is where the social justice starts to come into play. And the first thing that most people may have heard of, and if you hadn't, I'm about to tell you, is the fusion government. And the fusion government was basically an agreement between blacks and whites that they would split the elected positions between blacks and whites. And this la agreement lasted until 1910, which basically it lasted longer than Reconstruction because the local folks got together and decided this is what we're going to do. But unfortunately, just as national events happened and ended Reconstruction, the same thing eventually happened in Georgetown through um, racial strife, lynchings, and, and other, um, the Brownfield incident, which ended up in a riot. Um, ended the fusion government, but it laid the groundwork for social justice. Um, in Georgetown, and unfortunately it ended in 1910. And here we also have a picture of the first coroner circled in red, Adam Dunmore. He was the first coroner of Georgetown County, but he was also a master carpenter and a mortician. And with his brother, Samson Dunmore, actually built Bethel AME Church, the wooden structure of Bethel AME Church that is now encased in brick that everyone knows. And that's important to know um, in a few minutes because now Bethel AME is very much a social justice driven church and it goes back to its roots. But on Front Street from 1865 to 1910, it was majority African American businesses. And those businesses, and this is a, a thorough list of those businesses that we find here, those businesses included um, blacksmiths, um, leather goods makers, um, merchants, butchers, um, restaurants, um, just almost everything that you needed, stables, feed and, and, and livery stables, everything that you needed in the 1860s, the African Americans provided. And we have um, proof of this in our research through the KO, the Committee for African American History Observances. They did a wonderful job with their research and documenting those merchants. Unfortunately, through time and of course racial strife and also lack of access to funding, eventually these businesses were not passed on. Children left Georgetown for better opportunities. So leaving Georgetown actually has been going on for quite a while. Also some of the businesses, and this is actually a very famous picture, you may have seen it. This is the Atkinson Family Meat Market. They are just some of the butchers, general, and drug stores that were in Georgetown. And you can see there are quite a number of them. And these names are actually, you will find there are some folks still here, family members, the Winleys, the Smalls, the Browns, and the Atkinsons are actually still around in one form or another. We also had ship and boat pilots because remember, as the map showed, Georgetown, we have a number of rivers and they end in Winyaw Bay. So many of the enslaved were, were top boat folks and pilots. And we have listed here Sam Williams, Prince Colt, Cuffey Gardner, Thomas Frazier, and so on. And George Harriet was also known as an owner of a number of ships. So they not, were not just the pilots, they were entrepreneurs and actually owned a number of ships. George Harriet was also an owner of the Georgetown Advocate, a newspaper, one of the owners of that. Our next is beauty and barbershops. You can see our own Joseph Hayne Rainey, the first congressman in the United, first African American congressman in the United States, was actually a barber. And in Bermuda, where he left Georgetown, Charleston, because he was conscripted into this um, Confederate Armory, 
army and he escaped to Bermuda, there is the Barber Alley in honor of Joseph Hain Rainey because he was a barber and he came back. That's how he made his living and he came back and he ran for office. We also had the Fanolin Beauty, um, Beauty um, School. That's the first African American owned in the entire state of South Carolina, right here in Georgetown. And of course, we have the continuation of barbershops, Randy's Barbershop, Apex, and so on. So that's a grand tradition in the African American community in Georgetown. And then we have newspapers, the Georgetown Planet and the Georgetown Advocate. The Georgetown Planet was started by James Bowley, and James Bowley was the grand nephew of Harriet Tubman. And he came down here to Georgetown after the Civil War in 1867 at a fairly young age, became an educator, also married locally, and eventually founded the Georgetown Planet. He also became um, a State House representative and a very well known. And if anybody knows, if you go down King Street, the house is under construction now. Um, and they're doing a wonderful job in restoring the home. And a George Georgetown advocate was another important newspaper in Georgetown because education was huge. It was huge because that led to greater economic growth, but it also led to social justice. And a big thing in Georgetown were our master carpenters. And our next slide is the construction and builders pre and post Civil War. And here you see Mr. Samson Dunmore. Early you saw a picture of his brother, Adam Dunmore. They were master carpenters, and they built Bethel AME, just one of the many buildings that they built. And um, they also built the original parsonage at Bethel AME. And Mr. Marge Singleton was also a well-known builder. But there were a great many builders in Georgetown of African-American um, descent, and very interesting names, Marge Singleton, Welcome Beast, um, Hard Time Sparkman, Ben Great, Bill Wiles Sr., and Sammy Martin are just some of the few. And I actually knew the last one, Sammy Martin, I kn knew him personally, <laughs> went to school with his son. But these were builders who built most of the historic homes in Georgetown or repaired those homes. And there was actually a, clo a quote by um, one of the Rosens who said you would always see um, the Dunmores walk, going around town while they were repairing or building homes and they were always followed by 10 to 15 laborers who worked for them. All right, so this laid the foundation for social justice. Coming off the plantations, they had skill sets, they were immediately able to get to work and start building money and start collecting money. Um, upon money, the little bit that they already had, and they were able to build uh, buildings such as Bethel AME. And it's important to note the original building of Bethel is a wooden structure that is encased inside of the brick structure of Bethel AME. The, brick, the, the wooden building was 1865. It was then bricked in in 1908. And the church continues to be a community institution, but back then it was very much a community institution and it also lent itself to social justice. So what basically was happening is these folks were collecting their monies and they were helping their community. They were helping people get educated, they were helping them um, get settled as freed persons. Your leadership came out of these churches. So social justice became a great tradition in Georgetown. And it actually did cause some strife because even within the African American community, there wasn't always agreement. There were not a monolith, but also it caused racial strife because even though they owned a great many of these stores and, and um, businesses, one thing they did not control were banks. The banks were still controlled by whites. So that created a lack of access to money, to money. So once again, you go back to your roots. And in West Africa, they worked together cooperatively and collectively. They were able to pool their money together to build bigger and better things, such as Bethel AME. Because in 1865, what the congregation did is they pooled their funds together to, to the tune of $250, and they were able to purchase supplies, and they floated logs down the rivers into Winyaw Bay 
to the foot of High Market Street and um, Wood Street. They carried logs on their shoulders to where the churches were, and they built those churches using the skills. And that didn't go through banks. They didn't go get the loan from the bank because they couldn't. They had to pool their funds together that they had, the little bit they got has um, in, the enslaved, and it also has freed persons. They pooled their money together and built these churches. So that launched the grand social justice traditions of Georgetown. So you cannot disconnect these things. You have to connect the economic justice with the social justice, with the cultural aspect of everything. And I hope you, just a reminder, if you have any questions about any of this, please just shoot us some questions. I would love to answer them as we move along. So what is a community? One of the things we have in Georgetown is not seeing the uh, investment African Americans have put into Georgetown County, not seeing the impact of African Americans in Georgetown County. So as part of this presentation, I wanted to ask, what is a community? Do you see me? Do you hear me? The state of black Georgetown County and our Gullah culture will save us. I want to note the different, not just the merchants that we had in Georgetown County, but the different uh, types of facilities and businesses that we had in Georgetown County. And one of those, well two actually, are museums. And the museums in Georgetown included the Gala Museum that's found off of King Street now. And it's a wonderful place to really get the details and understanding of the Gala culture and Gala history. So I do encourage you to visit the Gala Museum. We now have the West End Heritage Center, which is an outgrowth of CAO, the Committee for African American History Observances, the Dream Keepers Community, Community Arts Center. So if you want to know more about the West End heritage and businesses and history, it's a wonderful place to go. It's uh, operated now by the Howard Alumni Association. But if you really, beyond the hour that I have with you today, if you really want to see folks who made a difference in Georgetown and beyond, it's a wonderful place to go. Um, and I encourage that. We also have a medical history in Georgetown. Our first African-American doctor was Dr. Ulysses G. Teal. He is buried in the Bethesda Baptist Cemetery, where he was a member at Bethesda Baptist. But he was the first African-American doctor. And he was known for riding his bicycle around Georgetown and also borrowing the hearse to go pick up someone who was sick. So I don't know how many of us want to see a hearse pulling in our yard, but in that day and time, that was the interconnectedness. You had to help each other, so you took the hearse to go pick up someone sick. And of course, Ms. Florence Williams, a nurse, who founded the first hospital in Georgetown that served black and white patients. And she actually is just one of the seeds that led to the current Thailand's, Thailand's health hospital system, and so we give honor to her. We also have a building, it's, it's a residence now, but the original dental office of Dr. James W. Dunmore, who was a dentist in Georgetown, and also the office of Dr. Beck, found at the corner of King and Prince. And actually, Dr. Dunmore's dental office is found on King Street. Many of you may have um, seen it has a red brick building, but it has been recently painted. And I actually, when I went to take the picture, I was like, oh my gosh, I couldn't find the house anymore, but realized that it was painted and it's no longer red brick. But these were um, African-American medical professionals in Georgetown that, and many times back in the day, didn't actually get money for their services. They bartered for the chicken. They bartered for the veggies until um, nationally what happened that helped a lot of doctors was Medicare. You know, prior to Medicare in 1965, a lot of doctors did not get paid. They actually bartered for services. And it's a grand tradition, once again, that we're noting in Georgetown with our Gullah community. And you can still see these buildings to this day. Also, music and entertainment. We have McKenzie, Magnolia, and Bernie Beaches. And I say all three because People, some people say Magnolia Beach, some people say Bernie Beach, and some people say McKenzie Beach. It's actually the same area. 
All right. What's, what most people see now in Pawleys Island is Mackenzie Beach with the old motel. And we have a wonderful picture here with that motel right there. That is what is properly known as Mackenzie Beach. And you see some folks right there to the right enjoying the surf and the water. But Mackenzie Beach was started by the Mackenzie family and they brought in, my parents told me this because they remember, and actually my family still has some property down there. Um, they remember Cab Calloway coming in, Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald coming through Georgetown on the Chitlin Circuit at McKenzie Beach, and they, that's where they went for their entertainment, or Atlantic Beach in Horry County. But McKenzie Beach was the place to be. And we also owned a radio station, the Hugh family, 1470 AM radio. Um, that is on King Street also, right there. Um, it is still, the building is still there, and folks probably realize now that that is Colonial for Forest is in that building, but it is still there. Um, but historically, it was a lot of African American businesses were in that building. And I also just want to note some additional historical black businesses. Um, Beans is in the old Hudson. Um, Family Auto Garage building, they, they had a garage business there. The Hudson family is now known as Beans. Uh, shoemakers coming out of the post-Civil War era. Thomas Jefferson, Ladson McCoy, blacksmiths, Andrew Ferguson, James Harrell, Pinky Gordine, tailors, and we still have tailors in, in um, Seamstress in Georgetown to this day, a grand history, Philip Brunson. Emma Gadsden, A.J. Gill, Ben Frazier, and Benji Williams. And this Ebony Diamonds was a directory in the early 2000s, 2003, 2004, that listed African American businesses. And I use that now with the work that I do as a resource, but unfortunately what has happened, a lot of African American businesses have closed. Um, but that is an excellent historical research, a resource, excuse me. The reason I wanted to give you this background with African American businesses in Georgetown is one, to educate folks that we have African American businesses in Georgetown. I think too many times people don't realize that African Americans have ownership in Georgetown. Um, there are some issues though. And one of the issues is, is that lack of access to funding. That continues to this day. Another issue is um, not passing it on to the next generation. And that's for various reasons. Um, lack of opportunity in Georgetown has led a lot of younger generations to leave. I myself left Georgetown for, better for education and better opportunities, but I came back. Because there are opportunities here and now, but you have to recognize the interconnectedness of culture, economics, and social justice for our community to progress. And that is where we do the work across all of those aspects of our culture and all cultures. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more um, in our next segment. But our next segment is where do we go from here? The end of cultural appropriation investing in black communities, invest, investing in black businesses, and coming full circle. What is cultural appropriation? For too long, the culture of the Gullah Geechee has been, uh, one, neglected through apathy or lack of knowledge, but also it has been exploited. And the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce, of which I am CEO and founder, a couple of months ago, we started a, uh, an issue advocacy to end cultural appropriation. We call for the end of cultural appropriation. And that included three aspects. I, I jumped ahead of myself, got one out of order. And that is one, demand individuals and companies to seize and desist the cultural appropriation of the terms gala, Geechee, and or Geechee spelled G-E-E-C-H-I-E. -E. Um, boycott companies without transparent gala African American ownership who are appropriating the terms gala Geechee and or Geechee and or the imagery of members of the Gullah community 
and increase and continue to spend your money in Gullah and black owned businesses. Because remember, the economic justice and the social justice and the cultural aspect are interconnected. You cannot disconnect these three aspects. And it's actually even more complicated than that. And then that. But for purposes of time, we're going to focus on those three. The cultural appropriation is when you take someone's picture from the community and you put it on your product without equitable compensation. Cultural appropriation is using Galagichi in the name of your company, and you cannot trace your lineage to an enslaved African or African American. Now, most African Americans, we cannot trace our lineage to West Africa, but we, most of us can trace it to some person, an individual who was enslaved on a plantation or in a town setting. So if you can't do that, we have stepped up, stepped up as the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce, and we have pushed for the end of cultural appropriation. And I must say, that it has been effective. We've gotten some media coverage, but we've also had some companies proactively take products off their websites and shelves and rebrand them. And we salute those companies, and we actually support those companies because we understand that everybody wants to make a paycheck, everybody wants to have a good life, and everybody wants to leave something to their children. But for the value of our community, it's our culture. And that's something we have to be protective of. And we have to, even ourselves, enjoy and celebrate that culture. And we cannot do that when others misappropriate it. And that's the bottom line for the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce. Um, so we're fighting to end cultural appropriation that was built from the beginning of what I said, that rice industry the bartering and cooperative economics of working together, of growing that garden quietly in the corner when you had a little extra time, or renting yourself out to others and just tucking back a little bit of money to help your family. Because someone worked in the field one day and dreamed of freedom, not maybe for themselves, but for future generations. And the least that we can do is to fight to hold on for, to our culture and make it better and stronger for future generations because that will make a change in our community. And I'm gonna go back one, one um, slide because one of the things I decided to do as an individual to invest in my community was to start the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce. And our mission is to raise global awareness, profitability and sustainability of African American businesses and other entities that support the Gullah community. And we say other entities because from day one, we have been inclusive. It takes all of us together to help this investment in growing the African American community and also allowing this community to bear the fruit of its labor of hundreds of years and to be the power that it can be in the United States and this world. We also started the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Foundation, which its mission is to raise funds to support the educational programs of the Gullah Geechee Chamber. And this fall, with the help of many volunteers, we will be launching Gullah Geechee University, the business of doing business. We're going to be hosting workshops, some free and some with a small fee, where our business owners who are working now, who are not necessarily uh, right with the Secretary of State, for example, can get their paperwork done so that they can be mm -hmm. on the right side, so they can have access to PPP loans, for example, during this COVID-19. Because a lot of our businesses could not take advantage of those loans because simply they didn't have the paperwork done. And that is for historical reasons. And that's why I talked about folks r being rented out and getting a little bit of money or growing a small garden plot quietly and secretly because that's actually a historical reason why folks may not trust the system because the system too often worked against them. And when we did do a little good, 
lynchings happen. A lot of lynchings happen for economic reasons. Or they didn't make enough because they didn't have enough access to funding to invest in their business and grow it and turn it over to the next generation. So the next generation ended up leaving. All right, so we want to end that. But it takes education to do that. And that's one of the reasons I founded the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce so that my community can have the opportunities to reinvest back in our communities and to grow our businesses to allow just some of the simplest things of life to happen. Keeping our children at home, having them educated at home, and having that genera generational wealth grow for, for future generations. So that's one of the uh, overall things that we did to start the Gullah Geechee Chamber. And that's why social justice and economic justice and the cultural aspect are all interconnected. All right, so I'll move forward here. And our culture will save us. Basically, what goes around comes around. So the culture of the Gullah Geechee is becoming more recognized and celebrated. And even here in Georgetown County, which is the center of the rice culture, which made many white persons millionaires back in the 1800s and 1700s, it is now our opportunity to celebrate who we are and it will save us economically. And you see it in businesses such as, businesses such as Tours de Sandy Island by Mr. Romy, Captain Romy Pite. He's actually a, a captain continuing those maritime traditions. The Sandy Island Cultural Center, Plantersville also has a cultural center. North Santee Sampit, they're growing and creating businesses in that area that focus on the culture. We have Mary Graham Grant, a sweetgrass basket maker from Georgetown that's known, known nationally. We have Tour de Plantersville, um, hosted by the Village Group. These are organizations and events that celebrate our culture that will allow us to be profitable and sustainable as businesses that will allow us to share our voice, not only as businesses, but also within the social justice realm. And we also ask everyone to invest in black businesses. We have Love's Elements, one of our African-American businesses, handcrafted artisanal um, candles, soap. These young folks are really learning. They're going back to their roots. Um, this is just soap that's been made, handmade, in the traditions of the gala. Candles, hair, beauty products. These are handcrafted, authentic, organic products that our young folks are now tapping back into their roots. Um, Well-known artist Zenobia Washington Harper with her dolls. She's a well-known artist. We have um, our floral shops our convenience stores that are still in our communities. Just, we all remember the old mother of the neighborhood who would sell the nabs and the soft drinks to make a little change. And most of the time, just to reinvest in her own family or help our kids in the neighborhoods. Those businesses are still here in Georgetown County throughout Andrews, Sampit, Oakland, Plannersville. The Walk of My Neck, Merle's Inlet, they're still here, and we ask that you support and invest in these businesses. We have young folks who are now recognizing the Airbnb, for example, in Georgetown. They're recognizing that folks want the experience of going crabbing or oystering or fishing and then having that Friday night fish fry. So the businesses have always been here in Georgetown. They, for historical reasons, even when we were enslaved, we were entrepreneurs and tried to figure out how to make a little bit of money that to this day we benefit from because they invested in our community institutions, our churches. They invested in newspapers. They invested in our education. And, and today the circle is coming full and we encourage our young people to continue the work and we encourage everyone to invest in our black business regardless of who you are. Uh, so my name is Marilyn Hemingway. It's been wonderful to be with you today. I am available for questions and I hope 
my wonderful crowd here with me <laughs> has questions for me. And, um, and those of you who are watching us online, please shoot us a question and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. <laughs> Dan's coming up. Come on, Dan. I, we'll do the social distancing thing. Yes. I'll stand. <laughs> Thank you so much, and we'll, let's give a round of applause for thank you, Marilyn, thank you. and thank you so much. Thank uh, you. And that was a, it truly was a wonderful uh, wrap up to the, to this series, the DigiBridge series. Um, we'd had, uh, Zenobia Harper was here, um, <clears throat> so she gave a, a, a talk for us. Uh, about uh, one of her, her creative works. Uh, she kind of interpreted it for us, the Gullah Dreamkeeper, a poem she wrote. Uh, so that was wonderful, and that connects with, you know, a lot of what you were saying, giving us the history behind it. Um, who else? We had uh, Laura Harriet from Sandy Island, mm -hmm. you know, speaking uh, to us about uh, about the history and uh, of Wilma's Cottage out there, and uh, Dedrick Bonds, uh, was here. He was uh, here last week, I guess, talking about uh, KO and the history there. And you mentioned the, mm -hmm. the West End uh, uh, Museum, which is wonderful. So, and he had uh, three of the founders with him, which was terrific. Uh, Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Hewell, uh, and uh, uh, Mrs. White as well. So, and you, you kind of did a, a, a wonderful job of wrapping things together there with your talk and well thank you get, you know great uh it went into the past in great detail but also the the past isn't past it's it's here with us and you're saying that's it, definitely true it, it, and that's a deep past too i mean this is going way back this is hundreds of years deep um and the way you, you talked about how gullah started it was slaves communicating enslaved africans finding a way to talk uh, um, among themselves and also uh, communicating with uh, the, the whites, with the, the overseers and the, the masters. Mm -hmm. So, and that's kind of the, the interconnectedness, it, you know, this incredible, incredibly uh, complex language system developed as well as this culture. Um, so it's, you know, it's a, that, that dense, intense history and culture uh, that is Gullah culture, and it's, it seems like a small geographic area, Georgetown, Georgetown County, and yet, you know, Gullah is this uh, really a global phenomenon. It really is, and there is a saying, I don't know if you've heard it or not, that there's something in the water in Georgetown, and there is a reason that the first African-American U.S. congressman came from Georgetown. There's a reason that the first African-American first lady has roots in yeah. Georgetown. And Georgetown has many African-American leaders that came out of Georgetown that left Georgetown but have made an impact. I mean, we've had college presidents, um, um, just people in government have done great things and people don't know who they are as individuals, but their roots are right here in Georgetown. Yeah. And it and it, it has that history. At Georgetown is a port city, one of the third oldest in South Carolina. Yes. And it, it was this, uh, you know, this thriving place because of the rice. Uh, the rice. It was the epicenter of that that rice empire. Mm -hmm. But it it uh, it did, you know, produce all that uh, you know, the, all that wealth, but uh, also the, you know, the culture that went along with it, and that's. Um, that the rice production went away, but you know a lot of that that culture stayed. The is culture what you're stayed, and one thing I do want to emphasize, and, and I didn't emphasize it here because of the focus, but it was hard. This was not something that you know people were brutalized. Uh, yeah. People died creating that rice culture to make other people wealthy. We still have not benefited from that labor. But within that brutality, we found a way out of no way. You, you talked about the, yeah. the and that, that was uh, one question I was gonna ask you a little bit more about yes. the ties that bind. Uh, you talked about the task system. You know, the task, if you got through it, that those were not, they were enforced tasks yes. for the enslaved uh, Africans and they, you know, obviously not pleasant tasks hard, uh, brutal work, 
Uh, but if you got through your task, then you might have the opportunity uh, to go and take part in that other system, the barter yes. system. But, yes. Um, could you say, so we shouldn't, you know, avoid that, uh, that really dark and brutal part of uh, the labor system that enabled the, the rice uh, empire to flourish, mm -hmm. certainly not. Uh, but in, in all that darkness, there is that light of the culture that, that was able to, uh, to, somehow, uh, to somehow flourish. Uh, and that's, I think, the ties that bind, the yeah. reason I use that title is because the ties to West Africa. Okay. The ties that bind us to each other, white and black. Because in that system, we were still tied together, yeah. not only because we were free labor and there were owners, but we were tied together because a lot of us are related to each other. <laughs> you know, so those are ties that even. bind either. And they, they, and when I say related to each other, that's a whole nother topic. I'm sure mm -hmm. somebody probably spoke on it, but um, I hope they did, or maybe that's for future. Those are ties that bind us also. And the ties that also bind us economically from post-Civil War, with African-Americans being more than 90% of the population, the whites had to rely on them to provide certain services and skills for them to survive also. Um, the issues were many, one of which is we didn't have access to funding. The funding came from what we were able to produce ourselves. We couldn't go into a bank and get an investment or a loan, um, not in a regular sense. Um, there was money exchange, but that also goes back to those ties of family, hmm. you know, because there were some investments made, but that was very small. But overall, there weren't really investments made, but there were ties to bind us, and those ties go back to West Africa, which we still benefit from today, the ties that developed through the rice system itself, which we benefit from today. I think what's happening now, though, with the Gullah community, African American, is we are celebrating who we are more. Mm -hmm. and, and the profiles being raised. And in that can be some financial benefit. We can open businesses such as tours, the Sandy Island, tours, the Planterville, Plantersville, mm -hmm. that then will allow us to build some generational wealth. Yeah. And so more the ties, there are more links, uh, perhaps, than divisions, uh, even uh, links across the world to back to Africa and, uh, and here to, to this uh, postage stamp on the, on the edge of South Carolina. And, and as you were saying, it's spread from Georgetown to, to the White House yeah. you know, with yeah. Michelle Obama and, yeah. and everywhere else. But, um, but also across, e even with family ties and genetic ties, across racial lines, mm -hmm. white and black, and, mm -hmm. that, and that there were times in Georgetown County history where there really was this interdependence, and that that seems to, there are other times when that's split apart, where there have been these rigid divisions, mm -hmm. and maybe there should be, we need to get back to a time where there's more uh, where there's less separation again, where there's more We, we need to have a real conversation. And this is why the DigiBridge series is actually comes into play and it's very good. This, if we view this as a foundation, as a starting point where we can get knowledge and history and understanding, then we need to have a conversation so we can strengthen the positive ties and maybe end the negative stuff. And that's where racism comes into mm -hmm. play. Because ultimately, it hurts all of us. It doesn't benefit all of us. Because as long as your foot is on my neck, you can't move. So it hurts you too to hold us down. You know, we're seeking equity. We're not seeking revenge. We're seeking equity. And that, but that takes a conversation. It takes these type of things to start educating but then from here, the next step is who's going to have the conversation? Okay. So DigiBridge is kind of building a bridge forward is what we're hoping to do with these. Uh, and they are conversations. So, um, so hopefully building a, a bridge forward and uh, a fa laying a foundation. Uh, and I think the 10 presentations uh, 
concluding with this one, but, uh, but not ending, we hope. Uh, <laughs> And uh, concluding this series, concluding the series, <laughs> but uh, but and they if you missed, I should should say if you missed the live version today, they are up on uh, YouTube. They will be all up on YouTube so you can catch them there or review them uh, there as well. So they they will have a kind of afterlife uh, up online. Um, so that that is something to uh, to for further thought. I, I actually do a show, a gathering place as part of the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce. And it's based on our traditions because we would gather, gather under the tree, gather in the barbershop, beauty salon, gather at church, gather on the front porch, and we would have conversations. So that's why I named my show A Gathering Place, hosted by the Gullah Geechee Chamber, because we gather together and we conversate and everything. So, and that's part of this also, that we just need to talk together more and, and be truthful. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be easy conversation. It shouldn't be easy. Um, but we need to start someplace. Um, and that is, you know, something you were saying is that uh, for, for a long time, the, uh, and we talked about this with previous presenters uh, talking about government culture, but there was um, they were made to feel ashamed or there was a stigma attached to Gullah, it was, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's something else that seems to be turning around that, you know, that it is, uh, it's more, cel there's room to celebrate this now and it's, uh, Gullah culture is distinctive and independent and it's, it's something, it's good. It's, it's the, uh, our culture will save us was your, your phrase at the end. Oh, all right. We got, all right, from <laughs> Jinx Farmer. As a writer and plantsman who promotes flowers, many of which come from Africa via the Gullah culture, what's the most important thing I do or say to make sure I'm recognizing that history, not appropriating it? And you talked about appropriation, mm -hmm. and this is kind of literally you know, transplanting yes, yes. something. But so as a, a plantsman and a writer who promotes flowers, many of which come from Africa via the Gullah culture, what's the most important thing I do or say to make sure I'm recognizing that history and not appropriating it? I think you, if you're a writer and if, I don't know if it's articles or books, but in the footnotes or where it's appropriate, you do need to recognize where the plants come from. I think so many plants and flowers have become such um, a part of the American culture that people don't necessarily recognize that they're African roots. And one of which, I'll give an example, it's not a flower, but yams. Hmm. People don't realize they come from Africa yeah, yes. and they eat yams. I don't expect anyone every meal that they eat yams to say, this came from Africa. <laughs> but it's just a grand example of how, the, how much has been blended into the culture. But if you're writing about it, writing about yams, I think in the books, the footnotes, it is very appropriate to acknowledge where those plants came from. Hmm. Yeah, so I think that's the best way to do it. But I don't think, I don't expect everybody in a situation such as that to go to every Gullah person and say, they came from Africa, right. these flowers came from Africa. But definitely in your books, your articles, I think they do need to be acknowledged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to, Good to, question. Be, to be aware so that you're not that as much correct. as possible. And that is especially correct. Especially when you're writing. Uh, yeah. That is correct. So, but interesting there. And we do get so much. Um, so much in our culture, like you were saying, yams and so much of our food. Okra. That's a great okra. I love okra. Yeah, I'm fried growing okra, okra now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. fried but, okra. Uh, yeah, people don't realize that they come from Africa and they came because of the um, um, West African influence yeah. in the culture. Yeah, rice. Rice, yeah. That's rice. Carolina gold rice. Yeah, the, the, the technology to grow rice was from West Africa so that they were enslaved not only for physical labor, they were enslaved because they, of the mental yeah. knowledge. Um, and that needs to be recognized. And going back to what you were saying with the appreciation, celebration of the culture and the language, um, it, it too happened with Native Americans, in particular after the Civil War, with the Gullah language that you know, um, it was educated out of us. 
-hmm. And I actually tell people, I am not fluent in Gullah. Now, you may have heard the term code switch. When I'm with family and friends, I speak differently. But Gullah is not natural to me because my family, it was basically educated out of us. Um, but yeah. what is happening now, a lot of folks are coming back home or they're now appreciating it more that they're learning Gullah has a language. So we're actually bilingual. And, but that yeah. was never stated before after the Civil War 100, 150 years ago. It was like, that's bad. You must be educated out of you. But it was the isolated communities that saved the language. But now we have, it is growing where more and more people are coming back home and they're relearning the language yeah. of their childhood. So it's, I don't think it's dying. I actually think it's blossoming because yeah. of that. And pe people, li linguists are studying. Gullah. And they're studying it. They're yeah. studying it they're at thinking, Harvard. Yeah. They're actually educating the yeah. students at Harvard they're about Gullah because it's, yeah. it's, 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 I say, we are the indigenous people now of this area. Yeah. We are connected to the land and the water in the ways that indigenous people are. And that's why I say our culture will save us when it comes to climate change, the environment, et cetera. And because we, if we go back to our roots, and, and a lot of us are still there, but recognize our roots, it will help not just the Gullah people, us. It's going to help everybody to understand the importance of the rising sea levels and how it impacts climate change, et cetera. So when I say our culture will save us, it's not just us, African Americans, it's gonna save everybody. It's, it's transferable. That's it's, right. It's shareable. That's right. shareable. It and, is, and very much so. And so that's why with the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce, it's always been inclusive because this is about us. It's about celebrating the Gullah community, celebrating us, but it's about saving everyone. Yeah. And it, that hasn't always maybe been extended the other way. It, it hasn't, hasn't been a and we have to recognize street, that. That's say. not beating anybody yeah. up, but it yeah. has, <laughs> you so, know. But yeah, but there might be a better way. With it's a better way forward. Truth yes. conversations, a better way forward. That's correct. Reach to the future. Very so. much so. Okay. Very much so. All right, and so thank you, and thanks to uh, to Jinx Farmer for that that question I know there. thank you very good question and, Mr. Farm yeah and and there might be sometimes folks do come in a little late with other questions so um, Marilyn does have a presence out there yeah I'm um, here I have is, a website gotta we're on Facebook um, a, I'm on Twitter yeah you yeah can, we're out there you can find her <laughs> and, you can uh, find me just get Google gotta get you chamber and and everything should be able to pop up and you can find me and I would love to answer any questions that people had or introduce them to any of our businesses yeah. in our community if you want to support those businesses um, and then every Wednesday and Sunday at 4 o'clock we do a gathering place on Facebook live yeah. and our YouTube channel we have a YouTube channel yes. I forgot we so have a YouTube channel well. so, yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah so, just Google Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce or Gullah Geechee Chamber and you will be able to find Okay, so the, she's she's all hooked up online gathering. I assume it's all virtual gathering places for now. With yes, the, the COVID it is. Situation. It was, yeah, everything with during COVID, all of our programs we took online. But I've already made a decision that once we get through this pandemic, that we will do a hybrid of online mm -hmm. and in person events because that's our future. Yes. I, that's our future, I that's and, and I like being online because I actually reach more people. Um, so yeah. if, you can't find, if you can't join us in person, we encourage you to join us online moving forward. All right. Excellent. Well, I want to say thank you again to South Carolina Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities for making this DigiBridge series possible. Uh, to our director, Dwight McInville, and our staff here at the Georgetown Library. And we have to say a very special thank you to Heather Pelham, who's working the camera and the lighting <laughs> and makes us look so good up here. Mm -hmm. She also edits for our YouTube channel, uh, so she makes us look even better there. And Truman Wynn out there, who is uh, a, a wizard uh, with, with uh, the space, uh, with the, uh, sorry, the, Facebook Live, uh, so he's he's our IT specialist and is brilliant. Uh, so we love them and uh, appreciate all that they do. 
Uh, so our, I guess our DigiBridge series is now in the books or more properly uh, stowed online here. And we really appreciate uh, Marilyn Hemingway for taking us out in good fashion. So thank you so much, Marilyn. And Thank you. Uh, we, thank you, Georgetown Library System. Thank you, Dwight McEnville. And thank you, Dan, Dr. Dan. Yes. He slid that in on me. And Heather and Truman, thank you very much. I enjoyed being here today. And I look forward to future programming from the Georgetown Library System. Yes, as the daughter of a librarian. Yes. I'm, I'm, I love librarians. <laughs> so, yeah. So thank love you. reading. Thank you very much. And uh, keep reading and thinking.